Hi everybody. I want to give you a bit of a background on myself. Uh, so I uh, studied machine learning and that's what my PhD was in. And then I switched a bit to uh, computational biology. So I come into this field from uh, computer science and what I do um, is uh, mostly develop computational methods, machine learning methods to uh, um, try to integrate the data to kind of get more informed opinion about uh, patients uh, and patient cohorts that we study. So uh, today's objectives are, first I'll uh, talk quickly about the single data type analysis from the kind of computational perspective. And this is always uh, good to do for um, data exploration purposes, even if you are working on data integration. Um, I will mention three most common data integration methods, um, most commonly used that I've seen. And um, I will talk briefly about feature selection and uh, classification type problems. So uh, this is the available patient data. It might not be available for every single patient for every disease, but across uh, several diseases, it's definitely all of this is available. So uh, DNA, as expected, mRNA expression, uh, epigenetic data. So epigenetic includes uh, DNA methylation, but also the epigenetic marks, uh, microRNA data, and protein data. So this is all omics. And a lot of this is now available for uh, large sets of patients, for, especially in cancer. Um, on the phenotype side, where you can derive different kinds of phenotypes, there are, there's uh, all kinds of clinical information that includes the, the tests, uh, questionnaire data in uh, neuropsychiatry, if any of you work there, then for sure you've seen the, a lot of questionnaire data. Um, imaging, of course, especially in neuropsychiatry, and uh, anything related to right now, anything related to uh, autoimmune disease, especially uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, you would see uh, uh, diet data being collected and also informing uh, kind of decision. So this data is not just uh, sitting in, in hospitals. This data is publicly available, some of it. And the best, uh, to my knowledge, such repository is the Cancer Genome Atlas where for the same set of individuals, uh, so this is uh, cases, for the same set of individuals, you will have, uh, and uh, you will have uh, exomes, SNP data, methylation, mRNA, microRNAs. And um, in overlap, if you take an overlap of all of this data, so not all of the data available on all patients, but uh, over 500, this data might be available on over 500 patients. So this is large enough cohorts to start kind of playing with and understanding different integrative methods, if that's your goal. So why do we really integrate patient data? Um, hopefully, integrating patient data will help us to make more informed decisions, uh, something that um, we can, we can help uh, doctors to integrate. Uh, apparently, uh, it's been analyzed and uh, published that uh, human capacity uh, to analyze multiple variables at a time is about uh, five variables is a limit. So we can put together five variables and make a decision based on five variables. We are talking about thousands, right? So this, this will have to be done computational, and that's, that's why we are doing this. So let's start with a single data type analysis. Um, so uh, let me go slowly, and I would really like a kind of an interactive session, not just talking at you, but please ask me questions, because the goal is to understand uh, kind of the, the kinds of analysis you, that you can do with this data. So this is a, um, a paper that was published in um, 2005 in PNAS, and it looked at 20 glioblastoma cancers, and gene expression on 18,000 genes, right? So what did they do? They collected gene expression. They looked at most variable genes um, across uh, their collection. And uh, they performed hierarchical clustering. I'll mention, I'll go briefly through what the hierarchical clustering is. Um, so here they identify clusters. Now, 
they identified clusters because they were looking at heterogeneity of this cancer and they were trying to identify patients, uh, uh, so homogeneous subsets of uh, patients that they had uh, in their hands. Um, when you're looking at disease versus uh, healthy individuals, it's the same kind of problem. You're trying to identify genes that are most differential between one group, which is diseased uh, individuals, uh, and the other group, which is healthy individuals. So in some sense, this is similar. So you can skip this uh, clustering step, and the rest would be the same. Then they identify the genes associated that were most uh, different between the clusters. Uh, and corrected for multiple hypothesis correction. I will not go through, uh, I will not talk about, is it part of the workshop? I don't remember the correction for multiple hypothesis. It will be mentioned probably, not directly. The point is that if you are looking at uh, hundreds of, uh, if you are looking at um, thousands of tests, it's very likely that you will identify some of the things by chance, right? Some of the some of the things that you've tested will come up significant by chance, and that's the correction is very important uh, when when you're doing that. So they have identified these genes, and you can see that on the the picture on the uh, what is it left for you, uh, right for me, uh, there are several genes that pretty clearly identify a set of, uh, of patients. So they're mostly red for the blue group and mostly uh, green for, the, for this orange group. So this is, this is a simple analysis. It's still being done. Um, but there are uh, a few problems with it, right? So what, do, what if you have more data? If you have more different kinds of data modalities, they will tell you something else about these patients. And these might not align with these groups that you find from the gene expression. So how do people handle it? How did people used to handle it before? Um, so the way it was done, for example, in this tw 2010 paper, this is a, uh, a classic uh, also glioblastoma paper. They had 200 glioblastoma patients. Um, and they took essentially also mRNA uh, expression, and they also clustered it in a kind of a similar way. They identified these four clusters, and I think each signature was about 80 genes for each of the clusters. So you can see it here in, in, in red. I'm sorry for the... Can you see? Oh, perfect. Both, both can see. So this is the kind of this four or five clusters, and... Um, They've identified uh, uh, the different types, and based on the genes that uh, were correlated with those clusters, they have uh, decided that these are proneural, neural, classical mesenchymal, mesenchymal groups. Um, so the problem here was that in this particular analysis, they, it was all uh, based on gene expression. So gene expression essentially was driving the groups. They've identified the groups based on one data type, and then they looked at mutations. If the mutations correlated with the uh, clustering that they found, they said, okay, this, these mutations agree and they inform our clustering. If they don't, they don't inform. So maybe they've added a few genes to refine their clustering, but the clusters were defined by this one single type. Um, and uh, what was interesting is that they actually had methylation data available to them when they were doing this analysis. And they said that the methylation data was just not informative. Right? And uh, the reason for that was that gene expression and methylation data did not correlate very well in this subset of patients. And um, they, it produced different types of clustering, and they didn't know how to reconcile that. So uh, in 2012, there was a contrary evidence uh, also in glioblastoma, was a glioblastoma study where they looked very carefully at the epigenetic data. And they found this. This is uh, one of the ways that they've confirmed the IDH1 subtype. If any of you have seen uh, glioblastoma uh, data or have heard about it, IDH1 subtype is basically the only subtype that, which is really well defined in glioblastoma where um, uh, this, this particular mutation causes a huge hypermethylation across many sites across the genome. So even though the proportion of patients, so on the this kind of x-axis, it's uh, patients. So the full set is 210 uh, patients. The uh, IDH1 subtype is a very, very small subtype, um, maybe 10% of the patients, maybe a bit less. Um, 
you could still identify it because the signature and mutilation was so strong, right? So this is, this is what happens when we start integrating data and start looking at the data from the perspective of a single type of the data stream, which is driving our analysis. We can miss this kind of things. And <clears throat> so I will tell you more about the type of uh, different types of approaches. Uh, the first and most common by far in, for example, the TCGA papers and other publications is to concatenate and cluster. So you can imagine what this is, but I will go in a little bit of detail, no problem. Um, through this analysis, uh, then there is a slightly more, uh, well, there is a more sophisticated method called iCluster, which is a kind of a latent factor type analysis, and the similarity network fusion, which is uh, the method developed in our lab. So the concatenation is simple, right? You have patients as rows, you have uh, your measurements as columns, so you have here, you have gene expression, you have methylation. You just uh, group them together and treat them all as uh, kind of a one vector per patient, regardless of the type. So the problems with that that we uh, found in our own um, uh, lab were that if the structure within each of the type of the data is different, you are washing it out, right? If, if there is some kind of uh, correlation between genes that you don't want to lose, if there is some kind of uh, difference in the structure of the measurements within the different types, you actually lose that and wash it out. And uh, additionally, if there are a few genes that are important, then you are just increasing your measurements by a lot. So uh, that is also a problem. So what they do is concatenate the data, and then you do hi hierarchical clustering. So many of you have probably used hierarchical clustering. This is approximately how it works. Um, so here you have six, let us say, individuals, right? So this is uh, already a correlation um, uh, matrix. You go from kind of patients to uh, patients by features to patients by patient matrix by just uh, either multiplying them or performing correlation on this uh, different uh, feature vectors. So here you have six by six patients and you look for the smallest distance between these two patients. So it's represented here also in a kind of in, a, in space and also as a, as a graph. This is uh, the, green, um, the green tree that you see is the most common uh, way to visualize hierarchical clustering. But the point is that D and F here are the closest ones. So you merge them first, you identify the mean, and then you look at the difference and you compress this matrix and you look at uh, the next uh, smallest difference. So the next smallest difference be will be between the mean of D and F and E. And those are the ones that you merge second. And you can see it here. And also you compare, you do it for all pairs essentially. And A and B are also small, so you merge them as well. Next. Uh, Etc. So you basically go through and compare all the pairs and uh, compress the matrix as you go. Well, uh, at the end, you have only two this meta groups, uh, the mean two means left from these two groups in this example, and then you merge it in. Uh, this is how you get. So to decide on the number of clusters here in this particular clustering, uh, what people do is. Uh, most commonly, actually, they're arbitrarily, uh, arbitrarily cut it by eye. So here you have um, this kind of diagram. So what people would do is uh, cut it into two clusterings because that looks like most reasonable from the dendrogram. Yeah, this, this uh, graph is called the dendrogram, uh, the tree. Um, Okay, another uh, measure very commonly used is a silhouette statistic. Um, eigengap is used for spectral clustering. So if you have a graph and that you are trying to cluster, you're trying to look at the di difference in the eigenvalues for that graph in the spectral decomposition. This is if you're using spectral clustering. There are many more. There's a thesis that was published that uh, looked at the different scenarios, simulated different scenarios, and compare the metrics, all the metrics, like maybe 15 of them, on these different scenarios. And basically, there's not one 
metric that is good for every single scenario. So some of them are good for um, kind of in a Euclidean space, and some of them are good on a on a manifold where it's not so straightforward, right? If where if you compress the clusters, they look very very close in a two um, D space, but uh, further away when you consider high dimensions. So basically, there are many examples, and there is not one good metric. And there is, if somebody tells you, "I found your clusters." You can ask them how they have uh, found them and which metric they used, and you can test other metrics to be uh, to be sure. Yeah. Can we have access to the PhD thesis? Yeah, yeah, it's online. The yeah, I just one. yeah search for the clustering. There, there are other. This is this is just yeah. You can just search for Jan and PhD thesis 2005. I think it's from Waterloo. Yeah. So. Um, here, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about Silhouette, because it, it is kind of very, very commonly used, if you, especially if you don't use the hierarchical clustering, or to verify uh, whether you like uh, you know, the, the clustering, what, what kind of clustering that you get from Silhouette. So the Silhouette statistic was uh, originally published in 1987. And uh, the idea behind it is it tries to figure out if the points uh, uh, closer to each other in your cluster versus further apart between clusters. So this is the, the difference between points within a cluster versus across clusters. Um, this is what the B and I stand for. So AI is the average distance uh, to all other patients for the individual I within a cluster. Um, and BI is the average distance to all other patients in other clusters. So for example, you can see in DNF, all of these points will be very close to, uh, in our previous example, will be closer to each other than to this cluster, for example. So, um, but it's not always the case. So silhouette uh, statistic, it uh, ranges between minus one and one. If it's one, it's an excellent assignment. If it's minus one, it's a bad assignment, a really bad one. Maybe you want to do exactly the opposite. And uh, zero is borderline, but zero means also that there is not much agreement in your cluster. It's, it's basically saying that your points are as uh, close to each other within the cluster as to the points in the next cluster. So um, this is an example of what silhouette uh, value plots look like. And basically, if it's positive, it's, uh, it means that all, all these points are closer to each other within a cluster. And the negative part means that within this one cluster, in this three cluster case, within one cluster, these points are closer to other clusters than to the other points in this cluster, on average. Right? It's on average. So this is actually, this is a, a very important point about clustering. Um, what clustering methods do is they place everything into a particular cluster, right? It, they assign everything. It doesn't matter if the data clusters naturally or it doesn't cluster naturally. It just will, it will produce a clustering for you. You say, I want three clusters, and it will find three clusters for you. Now, Silhouette allows you to evaluate how good your clusters are. And you, this, is, this is a point to always keep in mind. What can, yeah? Can you define what a pattern is in this case? Is it just all the features? Uh, are you referring to? Pattern, pattern here is just a point. Okay. Just a point. Yeah, like in, in this example, it's just a point in space. Yeah, pattern, entity, object. Uh, yeah. And some of the. Pattern can be a group of specimens as well. It can be, but in this particular case, you are talking about each individual point in your clustering. Yeah. So, uh, one way to see how robust your clustering is is to do this idea called consensus clustering. So this was published in 2003, but people use it, have been using it for a long time. So basically what you do is you take a set of your uh, features or samples that you want to cluster, and you subsample. You say, what if I take 80% of my patients? Will they still be together in the same cluster or not? And you do it a thousand times. You take a different 80% or 70% of your individuals, and you cluster them a thousand times. And then you construct a <coughs> consensus matrix. And the consensus matrix basically tells you 
how uh, <coughs> whether the individuals clustered in the same cluster if they were sampled together. So how often they belonged to the same cluster. So uh, here it's an, um, there is an important point that the number of cluster uh, the number of the cluster doesn't really matter, right? You can permute the labels of the clusters. It doesn't really matter. Cluster one and one case, cluster three in the second case, that doesn't matter. What matters is whether the individuals belong to the same cluster or not. So you look at all pairs of individuals. You construct a consensus matrix by being um, something, something actually something like this, I would say. Yeah. So imagine that these numbers are how often uh, individual A appeared with individual B in the cluster. So suppose 70% of the time that you've subsampled them together, they were clustered together. So that's a pretty good uh, and accurate uh, measure of the fact that they're probably uh, pretty, this is a pretty stable cluster. Now, this matrix doesn't work too well because normally you would have uh, all the values between 0 and 1, right? You cannot cluster together more than 100% of the time. But uh, the point is, the smaller the number, the, the less evidence you have of the fact, the less robust that pair is. And sometimes it's good to identify those individuals that don't cluster together well with anybody and just say, these are my outliers. These are not the individuals that should belong to a cluster together and maybe consider them separately, right? So this way you identify the cores of the clusters, something that you are very fairly certain about. Yeah. I'm just wondering, does this work equally well on all sample sizes, or would it, or does that matter? Well, the smaller the sample size, the, the less... Uh, Variance you, you will have when you when you sample right if you have 10 points and you sample them 80% of the time you get eight points, so there is a huge overlap on, in your samples So it, it It's less of an evidence you will have less of a confidence than than if you have a much larger space Yeah Okay, so this is this is the most standard approach the the um, concatenation and clustering and using consensus clustering improves the robustness of the results. So I would recommend always to always do consensus clustering. And I think there is a package in R also that does some consensus clustering. It takes much longer, of course, because it does the clustering procedure a thousand times. But it's it's worth it for the stability of the result. Um, okay, so the next uh, type of tool is this I cluster. So this is more of a latent. Um, kind of a factor model. So if you, you are familiar, uh, this is great. So what, what this approach does, and I will briefly mention it because it's also used in TCG papers and other type of papers, and I've seen it um, in uh, a lot of different publications recently. So what, it hap what happens is that they're trying to identify some kind of a latent space, some kind of a lat latent embedding, which is common among all data types. So they say, um, we believe that our patients, for example, cluster all in the same way, should cluster in the same way, um, given any type of data on my patients. And if that is the case, what they are trying to identify is an optimization problem where they try to identify this latent variable Z, which represents that latent embedding. We don't know what it is, but every one of the types of data that we have is informative of that. So what they do is they identify the common Z, and this W1, W2, and Wm, these are the projections of your original observed data, say, copy number data, how that projects onto this latent space. This is what they do, and this is what they find. They find this, um, this latent clustering in the latent space. Um, the problem with this approach, even though in their paper they kind of say that they don't... Uh, just look at the similarity. It actually ends up being that they are looking at the similarity of the um, of the data sets. And if you have some complementarity, uh, it is a problem. So this is the kind of what we looked at so far. Uh, I cluster is also a problem because it depends. The complexity of the method depends on the, the number of the measurements that you use, number of the features. So you can't use your twenty thousand genes. Um, uh, or all of your pro methylation probes in the I cluster. You have to select about 1,500 features. How you select that 
is magic. And you select uh, 1,500 features, um, usually by most variable ones or uh, something like that, maybe t-testing uh, with respect to some held out group. This is, this is not uh, necessarily part of the method, but you have to pre-select your features and then do the clustering in the latent space using these features. So this, this is uh, part. There are many steps in this pipeline. So first, the feature preselection, which is different between the different uh, uh, types of analysis. Um, and that, um, et cetera. And I already mentioned that uh, the, these methods don't really take the complementarity of the data into account. So uh, <laughs> seeing that, uh, we have developed uh, a different uh, methodology. Um, the methodology is this uh, called similarity network fusion. It consists of two steps. Uh, the first step is to integrate the data in uh, patients, uh, the, construct the patient similarity matrix, similar to how you do for hierarchical clustering. And then uh, we fuse this multiple matrices using nonlinear approach. So this is the first step. You go from the patient by, say, mRNA or gene expression. Um, and construct the similarity just according to the gene expression. So for example, the darker spots here, they mean that these patients are more similar according to the gene expression, to the genes that you have in your sample. Now, this, this matrix, if you just look at the correlation, this matrix is likely to be a full matrix, no zero entries. But uh, you can actually sparsify it. And if you do sparsify it, so there are two ways to sparsify uh, matrices generally. One is to cut by, by small values. So if you have 0 0.01 correlation, maybe you don't care about that. Even 10% correlation, you don't care. The way that we sparsify the data here is by k-nearest neighbors. So we keep the 20 most similar individuals regardless of their value, and we throw away the rest. And that helps us with numerical stability when we combine the matrices. So you do it for every single uh, type of the data. So you have the, these two similarity matrices. For example, one is from gene expression and the other one from DNA methylation. This, there is a kind of a legend on the bottom. And the second step is to iterate. Uh, we iteratively make them more similar. So how we do that is um, based on graph diffusion. So we basically take a matrix, we multiply it by the matrix you want we want to make it more similar to. And this is kind of like starting at a node in one uh, graph and continuing in another graph and coming back to the uh, first graph. So what, what this uh, procedure does, and we do it iteratively until it converges. So this is the similarity. So what this procedure does is it helps you to get rid of the noise, for example. If you have, um, you have some edges here uh, that are very very weak. So this indicates weak correlations. They're not supported by most of the data. So in that case, they disappear as you make the matrices more similar. On the other hand, for example, you have a very strong correlation here between these individuals, but it's not supported by all of the data sets. But because it's so strong, it actually uh, permeates all levels. And we can keep this complementarity that is introduced by the um, mRNA-based uh, kind of similarity into the other types of data. So this probably converges. And at the end of the day, we have one matrix or one network, corresponding network, which is actually supported by all the different data types, all the types of data. Um, so are there any questions? Because I'll present some of the results using this approach. Yeah? So we don't actually use other methods as part of this method. Oh, you mean uh, like types of measurements? Um, yeah, yeah, it's definitely, I mean, whether you keep a uh, weak correlation or not is numerical, right? So uh, there is no particular threshold that tells you, oh, if it's 10% 10, 10 we lose it, if it's 20% we keep it. 
So uh, it is possible that in one measurement, one type of measurement, we have the information, but we have 10 types of measurements. And the nine types of measurements do not actually support that, uh, that similarity. And of course, we lose it then. So it, it definitely happens, yes. But I guess it is the question uh, of how much uh, support there is across the different uh, types. So if there is a very, we definitely have the situation. I'll actually show it on a real example. Let me, let me show a real example. I, I will tell you that it doesn't always happen. So um, these are the TCGA types of data. We looked at five different cancers. So this is the glioblastoma that I've been talking about. 215 patients, slightly different cohort, but we had three types of uh, measurements, mRNA, methylation, and microRNA. So this is the number of measurements in each. Um, was in 2014 when we did the analysis. Uh, this is breast cancer, breast invasive carcinoma, kidney real, uh, renal uh, clear cell carcinoma, lung squamous, and colon adenocarcinoma. So we have five different cancers here. And we also had controls, uh, so healthy individuals uh, for whom some of the data was measured for these cancers. Actually, not necessarily healthy individuals, but the healthy samples from the same individual. Um, obviously not healthy individuals. Nobody does biopsy on healthy individuals. So, um, so this is case, uh, so this is glioblastoma, and this is the patient by patient similarity. This is the full matrix, and this is kind of the corresponding graph. Um, the topology doesn't really matter in the graph because the topology was taken from the, the fusion matrix, but um, it, and, but it makes it easy, a bit easier to compare. So you can see, and this, this goes back to the question that was just asked, you can see that there is some similarity according to mRNA, which is not really here in, uh, in methylation, but some of it is here in microRNAs, for example. And there, there, is other, there is a lot of uh, similarity according to methylation between those two clusters, which is not supported as strongly by gene expression or by uh, microRNAs. So a lot of this would, would go away. But what you can see is that each of the types of data give you a, provide different structure of how patients are similar to each other. And each of the different types, they also um, correspond to some degree. So every type has this, these clusters. But mRNA, for example, in this particular case, did not yield such a strong structure. So maybe, maybe here there's some structure, but such a strong structure as the other types of data, right? So by combining, we hope to take advantage of the uh, individual, uh, of all, all of the evidence that we have. And this is the fused matrix. It looks quite a bit cleaner because of the off-diagonal noise, the, the entries that were kind of the similarities, they did not correspond to each other in this uh, different uh, data types. So they kind of uh, went away. But uh, you can see that the clusters are similar to each other to some extent. But what's imp important and interesting here, even if this type of data, this data set is clustered, uh, you can see within clusters. Sometimes you will get a disease that looks like one of these clusters. And there is no intrinsic clustering to this particular cluster, at least not according to the data. But what's important to notice is that the colors, the, each edge is colored by what type of data supports it the most. So uh, green is microRNA, uh, pink is DNA methylation, and blue is mRNA. What's interesting to note is that pockets of this microRNA supporting the similarity between patients within cluster. Uh, there are also... Um, very heterogeneous. So, for example, there is a whole pocket here of patients who are also similar to other patients, but they're similar to each other according to microRNA and DNA methylation. So, there's some signature between these patients. So, when we start looking at patients as a whole, we can't necessarily distill it down to five variables that we can profile for these patients. It's a heterogeneous disease, uh, and even if there are some more uh, better defined overall groupings, uh, it, it's still very heterogeneous within each cluster. So um, we looked at the clinical, uh, clinical information, and I think you will have an example of that in the workshop. Um, for example, this is the survival, and this is subtype 3, and subtype 3 is here in blue, and this is the IDH1 subtype. Mm 
that I talked about. So this was actually very interesting. Of course, I'm not a glioblastoma researcher, but I had a meeting with another Jabado who was visiting here. And she came into my office, and I had this plot. And she said, this is IDH1. I said, what is IDH1? She said, this is it. Check. Check if this is IDH1. And every single patient for us, we didn't incorporate the DNA, um, the mutation data here, but every single one of the patients that were for, for whom we had the mutation data was uh, IDH1 mutant. So this is this is primarily due to the methylation, the very strong methylation signature that we had. So, but um, and in glioblastoma there is this very nice relation. In leukemia the relation is more complicated. So there is a, also IDH1 mutations that do not lead to hypermethylation of the, almost the whole genome. But um, the point is sometimes you can recover a uh, biological signal if it uh, permeates other types of data that you have collected, even by proxy. So the IDH1 um, patients, they're usually younger, but they have a better prognosis. So uh, what was interesting is that subtype 1, this big subtype 1, was the only one that seemed um, that uh, actually responded in some way to timozolomide. Timozolomide is the standard of treatment in glioblastoma. The other types of data did not, uh, the other, sorry, the other uh, subtypes did not actually uh, seem responsive to, to timozolomide. When you look at the data on three different levels, um, DNA, RNA, I mean, mRNA and uh, microRNA, they still seem to map into the same clusters. Was it the same genes that were mapping into those clusters? No. No. They actually weren't. We did look at that. I, I, when, when I'll be talking about feature selection, um, I can actually, given that there's almost time, let me, let me talk about that. I can come back to the rest. So uh, this is the... The, the feature selection. So this is where we looked, then we looked back, okay, we, ha we have our three clusters, and we looked back at mRNA expression, DNA methylation, and microRNA expression. And this is the standard, the t-test analysis that you would do, the pairwise t-test. So features, uh, this cluster versus not, and looking at each individual gene, saying which genes seem to be most responsive. And this was actually interesting because we did this analysis with a t-test, and this is the figure we submitted with the paper, and the, the reviewer said, well, it looks like you don't have signal. What, what is this figure? <clears throat> and um, even though it looked like to us, I mean, heat maps are intrinsically uh, hard to interpret, right? You can see d different people see different patterns. But uh, we started thinking about why we are not by picking up stronger patterns. And so what we thought about was that uh, this pairways test, um, they're missing something. And what they're missing is, these are not the genes that are corresponding to the kind of the three-way analysis. And even further, what would be nice, which we actually didn't do, uh, would be to see whether the patients are similar according to this particular gene in a fused matrix, right? Are they as similar according to this gene as, a, as they are in a fused matrix? So even within cluster, you kind of want to keep uh, preserving this, this similarity and keep uh, identifying genes that capture the full similarity across the, the, the patients rather than just between the clusters. But even when we looked at kind of this uh, three-way and we used uh, nor normalized uh, mutual information, you could see a much uh, better set of genes. So yes, there were a few genes, I think on the order of five to ten genes, that actually corresponded between methylation and mRNA. There were genes that were uh, had abnormal methylation in the promoter and had a different uh, a differential uh, gene expression, but like five out of this uh, set of genes, 250 genes. So the 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 answer is is that these are this, this is different biology that's being recovered from each of the individual uh, sets. So what were the initial subtypes, clusters, based on? Which data? At which level? Uh, the initial ones in this analysis? All of it. Oh. This is, this is the, okay. that's, this, all, uh, three all three types of data, all of, all of the data. 
Yeah, this these are the I, I skipped through this, but this is kind of uh, PCA plots that are very useful to visualize the clusterings. So you can see how much uh, the clusterings are spread. And so in BRCA, it looks like this is uh, a different cluster. Um, and uh, also, one thing that I want to bring up to you, if you work in cancer and you work in a, with survival analysis, if your clusters are very small, for example, in, kid, in kidney renal uh, carcinoma, here, this one cluster is very small. So if you move one of the individuals, the p-values go crazy. They just go crazy because p-values are very sensitive to the kind of the size of support that you have. And um, you can see here, the, re the reason we discovered it was that we started looking at the minus log 10 p-value uh, according to the different number of features. And at some point, the p-value just dropped. We added maybe 50 more features, and the p-value dropped. Uh, and we said, well, this is very unstable. How come? In other cancers, we are not, uh, we don't really depend on which features we select. We didn't pre-select features for this analysis. And in kidney, it seemed to matter in some very strange way. And what we discovered was this really tiny cluster that made the p-values unstable. So this is also something else to keep in mind. All right. And I have a couple of minutes. Uh, yeah, this is, this is NMI. You can... Look it up. This is uh, what we used uh, for for the analysis to identify the features. Uh, it's an information theoretic measure, but you can actually use uh, cross call Wallace if you want to do the the analysis. This is what we used in the paper. So what I want to mention now is uh, in especially in our cancer work, uh, what people want to do is build classifiers. So once you've identified the subtypes, you say, I have subtype 1, subtype 2, subtype 3. These are novel subtypes. How do I create a clinical test that will tell me, OK, I want my 50 genes. I want to test these 50 genes. And I want to be able to label uh, new patients that come in as subtype 1, subtype 2, or subtype 3. This, is, this problem is called classification. And uh, the way that uh, people kind of do it is they take the features that you have, you've identified either through T-test, cross call Wallace, NMI. You identify features that were significant from here, from this type of analysis that associate with the clusters. Then you build a classifier. Let us say random forest is a very common and well-loved classifier, and it works really well. And I have a question for you. It's a quiz. What, what is the problem with this approach? So you take, you, you've identified your subtypes, you take the features that seem to be associated with the subtypes, and then you build a classifier using those features. What is the problem? Overfitting. Yes, overfitting. You're overfitting. It's, a, it's called, in machine learning, it's called a leakage. You have a leakage problem. You use the same data to uh, create the clusters, and then you're using the same data to create the classifier. And it's a big problem. So. Uh, So the problem that it creates is with generalizability. What is generalizability is that if you have a different cohort of patients for the same type of um, kind of disease or outcome, your, res your results might not generalize because you've overfitted to the data that uh, you have built your classifier on. So uh, so how do we fix how do we fix this problem? One way one way to fix this problem, which doesn't solve it fully, is to take a subset from the original data, run SNF just on that subset, and then identify the features and train the classifier just on a subset of your data. At the same time, you can learn SNF on the full data and see if the classi classifier that you've learned uh, is actually predicting the same classes as if you had the whole data. Now, obviously, when a new patient comes in, you, you don't have the original SNF, so you will just be left with a classifier, and that's what you ultimately want. So um, you can compare the labels. So this is saying, if I had all of the data in the world that I needed to have to, to get maybe the best subtype labels, does my classifier uh, predict those labels as well? <laughs> 
So, of course, it's there is a bit of a leakage here as well, right? Um, you be, but you don't have any other kind of data. So this is a better approach than, than the original approach proposed, which some of the people use. It's very important to try to separate your training and your test set to know how well your method generalizes. Very important. Uh, and I think it's a very common problem in published literature, where people just report the training results. You actually don't know how well it will perform on the cohort outside of the hospital. So this is a better solution. It's not ideal, but if you don't have any other data, this is one of the ways that you could do. <laughs> so with that, um, there's some advantages to the networks. I propose it as, a, as a, an exploratory analysis of your data. So what we do is we kind of look at our original data, each individual uh, type of data, uh, separately. We compare what kind of classes you would get from each individual type of data. Then we class, uh, then we um, combine all of the data together. One other thing that is useful with networks is that you can visualize the networks and see, well, are they, does it look like there are real clusters or does it look like one big blob? Because if you just cluster and then look at the results of your clustering, you don't actually have a sense of, um, well, how bad it might be, right? Um, so the idea is that you actually have a way to visualize your data for your exploratory analysis. And then at the end of the day, if you still, if it looks like there are some clusterings, you can cluster and you have some certainty about this particular clustering. Uh, this approach uh, scales very well. You don't need to pre-select features. Uh, it also scales very well with respect to multiple different types of uh, data that you are trying to incorporate. So one of the plots I had that I skipped was uh, showing that it actually, uh, the time it takes is about the hierarchical clustering. So the, big, the biggest time sink is to construct the similarity matrix. Uh, once you've constructed the similarity matrices, it actually runs really fast. Um, all right, so uh, for the future, I think the simultaneous feature selection and data integration would be great. The kind of a problem with it is that Depending on the question you are trying to answer in the end, you're, you want to put a different objective for what kind of features you, you care about. For example, you're trying to build a, a drug response predictor. So depending on the drug, you want to incorporate different pathways, right? So your network, the final network will be different depending on what you use to com compare the patients. Some patients will respond in exactly the same way according to one of the pathways. And this information will not be informative at all if you are trying to answer a question for a completely different drug that has nothing to do with this pathway. So that's, that's something important to, to keep in mind. And that's it for me. Questions? Um, so you can, you can certainly do cross validation, you should do cross validation for your classifier as part of learning the classifier, but it doesn't remove the question of generalizability because you've just selected the features from exactly the same data. So it's really a question of, do you have any data leakage? Do you have any information that you are using in your classifier, um, that you've already seen? Right? You're already pre-selecting the features that will be used in the classifier. If you have a uh, held out set that you have not looked at, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the measurements being a completely different scale? Yeah. Yeah. So I would recommend that if they're on the different scale and you don't want to kind of uh, standardize the variables with zero mean, I would recommend to separate them into different types of, like different matrices, because for this method, it doesn't really matter how many matrices you combine. So to separate them and to uh, identify uh, similarities according to the variables of the same scale that are comparable, because otherwise numerically, the bigger scale variables yes. will dominate. Yeah. So, so we, 
uh, DNA methylation. Yeah, concatenation, they just normalize. They, just they, normalize. they either standardize the variables to zero mean uh, one variance or normalize them to be between minus one, one, or zero, one. Yeah. So this, this kind of works. The important step here is also to remove the outliers. So what we've done in some of this data is we removed the outliers and re-imputed the data. And the reason for doing that is if you, for example, scale something to be between 0 and 1, and you have a, a huge outlier, then your outlier will be at 1, and everything else will be at 0, like completely numerically uh, indistinguishable, right? So you kind of want to keep track of the outliers. And actually, I think in the workshop you will see. No, no. no OK, that's great. No outliers. I think at some point we, we definitely encountered that. Nice, but there's no outliers. <laughs> there's a, we uh, definitely have encountered where we construct a similarity matrix, and we just see two individuals are similar and nobody else. And then we say, well, this doesn't seem right. So you go back and you identify that these individuals had some kind of outliers in their data and some of their features that made everything else squash to zero. And so once you remove those outliers, you actually get a much better. Yeah? So maybe you could explain a little bit more about the second step in the S and that, which is the, the, like, when you're actually combining the data, so yeah. the iterations make the data or the data types more, or the structures more similar. And I just, I'm not really sure how? Um, so I can try to give, it depends on the background, so I can try to give some intuition. So you know how if you multiply matrix, matrix by itself, uh, it uh, gives you like all the random walks from that node of the second degree, right? the second order neighbors. You'll get all the second order neighbors with that. So, so basically, if you keep multiplying matrix by itself, it will give you a random walk from that node to, to, to nth degree if you mul multiply to the power of n, right, for that same matrix. So we use that same idea, except we multiply by another matrix, by the, the, second, the, the second matrix, and you come back to this matrix. So its multiplication goes like this. It starts here, it multiplies by, by this kind of matrix, it goes the random walk. It's, it's not, the random walk is not the best illustration because it's hard to, to, to visualize it directly, but the math is the same. You kind of, you start with this matrix, you say, okay, what are all the walks that I can do from this node in this other matrix? And at the same time, I want to preserve my second order. So it's a, it's a second order walk that's perturbed by the other evidence. And a, actually, if you have, I didn't talk about this, but if you have multiple matrices, what we do is we multiply by the average of all the other matrices. And because we sparsified the matrix by the K and N, it's relatively stable. So you can actually do that. Um, one, one thing that happens here, of course, if you take random matrices and you start combining them together, you'll get the random matrix back. And uh, we've experienced it once where we combined one, uh, a matrix with something that really didn't correspond. So we were trying to combine cytokine and gene expression data, and they didn't correspond, which was very surprising to us. But then we started looking at the cytokine data, and we had exactly the scale and outlier problem. And so we went back and said, we need to reprocess the cytokine data. We went back to our collaborators, and we actually started working with the original data before it gets transformed. And then we were able to combine it beautifully. So um, the way we do it is we look at the two matrices, and we look at the NMI. So basically, are they likely to produce similar looking clusters to each other or not? Yeah. I'm sorry. I, for me, you look at the formula, and it's like, oh, that's exactly what happens. But I don't have the formulas on, on these slides, unfortunately. So, But it, it's in a paper, if you want to look at the Nature Methods paper. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any um, disease types or I mean, data sets you've seen where this method doesn't work that well because the signal isn't as strong in like, all the different data types? Yes. Like, if you only had, like, does it, is it only for diseases where 
are really strong, like a signal across multiple. So um, the places where it doesn't work is, is uh, so it's much harder with DNA data. If you take genetic data and you com compare patients according to their genetic data, you just get ethnicity back. And ethnicity is usually not what you're looking for to try to infer, you know, the biology of your disease, right? Um, though it could be correlated with the biology. It's not usually the, the kind of signal that you want. So um, we've had a lot of kind of struggle with how to properly incorporate DNA data on a SNP level, for example. You take a GWAS data and you have 500,000 SNPs or a million SNPs. And how would you, you know, what do you correlate? So there you have to pre-select. So basically the underlying assumption of this is that the features that you are combining are able, are informative of the signal you're looking for in the data. So if they're not informative overall, like a signal in GWAS maybe, I don't know, there's, there are different ideas about how the, you know, the, what the complex diseases can be attributed to, but if you imagine that there are 10 genes that are relevant and you're looking at 20,000, then you're not likely to identify the similarity which is relevant to the disease. So the underlying assumption is that the features that go into comp computing similarity are informative of the disease, largely. You can have some noise, obviously, but largely informative.